I'll get right into it. So again, the, the title of the talk is Update on Food Allergy Research, and um, here we go. And maybe not. The advance is not working. Okay, I'm sorry. Hold on. I'll click on the uh, on the slide, oh, and then the advance should work. Okay. So uh, these are my personal disclosures, not Dr. Burke's. Uh, so I've had honorariums from the AMU company as well as DBB, and then we have grant support. A couple from the NIH, uh, as well as from the FAIR uh, group, and then the Wallace Foundation uh, has uh, given us some funding for our sublingual research. And um, again, hopefully none of those should affect this talk. <clears throat> so we do have some learning objectives for the actual talk, and uh, so I'll just read them out to you. So the goal after all of this will be that uh, hopefully the listener will be able to describe the status of research on various experimental treatments for food allergy, uh, and there are a lot of them. Uh, describe the common risks and benefits of the experimental treatment for food allergy, and then um, maybe just uh, maybe as important or more important is become familiar with the terms desensitization, sustained unresponsiveness, and tolerance, uh, because I think in the coming few months to year you're going to hear a lot about these treatments, two in particular, and these terms are going to kind of be thrown around, and I think it is important in in understanding sort of what the data shows and doesn't show to know what these things mean. And um, well, before I start, I do have a question here. So, uh, should I be expecting questions throughout, or just uh, kind of just go through the and capture questions at the end? Your preference. Okay, okay, because uh, I'm happy to stop at any point. So, okay, okay. so uh, again, just uh, some background that I'm thinking that most listeners on on this uh, call are probably familiar with, but um, it's always good to lay the background. And so food allergy clearly is a big, big problem, and um, kind of old data now from 2009 suggests that 3 million school-aged children have food allergy, um, and that number is suggested to be a lot more now. Uh, most recently, we've been talking about uh, about basically two in every classroom in the U.S. is the numbers that are given out, as well as about 15 million Americans total, adults and kids. Uh, and again, there's this strong suggestion that there's been an increase in food allergy over the last 20 years that kind of parallels the increase in all allergic diseases. Uh, and at this point, again, not clear kind of why that's happening. Uh, there is this idea of evolved dependence, um, kind of pointing towards this idea of sort of your microbiome and uh, the hygiene hypothesis as a potential uh, cause of this increase. But um, there are a lot of other theories out there. Folks are very concerned about sort of food processing and preparation. Um, you know, again, going back to the microbiome, but uh, overuse of antibiotics, um, again, hygiene hypothesis, and even things like vitamin D and otherwise. Uh, but at this point, again, unclear why, but there does seem to be this uh, steady increase in allergic diseases and in particular food allergy. Uh, focusing in on peanut allergy, where um, most of the, re the recent research has been, uh, that prevalence is uh, creeping over a percent uh, and seems to be sort of, you know, across the country and in many other developed countries as well. And we know that it's the most common cause of anaphylaxis uh, presenting to the emergency room. And unfortunately, although fatal food anaphylaxis is, is quite rare, so we still estimate maybe just a couple hundred per year uh, over the, you know, the millions of patients who actually have allergy, uh, it does seem that peanut allergy makes up the majority of those cases. So again, uh, another reason that there is a lot of attention on peanut allergy in particular. Um, and one of the reasons that we even need this talk is because, unfortunately, the standard of care is completely passive and defensive at this point. So really, it comes down to allergists making the diagnosis based off history and whatever level of testing, uh, and then really up to the parents or the patient to strictly avoid that food, uh, so label reading or whatever else it takes, and then be, being sort of ready in case an accidental reaction or an accidental ingestion leading to a reaction occurs. Uh, so having a self-injectable uh, epinephrine, an auto, epinephrine auto injector or antihistamines available. Um, but unfortunately, again, at, to this point still, there are no approved proactive therapies available, which is um, just in, very, very, very frustrating for anyone who has to deal with food allergies. And so, uh, again, trying to start with some of the uh, some definitions. Um, so if you think about immunotherapy, again, what are, what are kind of the goals that we're aiming for? And so... Um, up front, when we first started a lot of this research 10 plus years ago, really two terms were, uh, we used two major terms. One of them was desensitization, and then the other one was tolerance or clinical tolerance. And so desensitization we thought of as really kind of increasing that, that reaction threshold. So being, uh, being able to tolerate more of the food while you're actually on treatment, 
uh, for it, but in a way being dependent on being act on active treatment. Um, and that was compared to uh, clinical or even immunological tolerance, where, again, the idea there would be that you are completely non-responsive -re to the food allergen, regardless of whether you're on treatment or not. Um, and, uh, but, you know, again, I think one, uh, this will become a theme of some of the, uh, the studies we'll go over, but one of the problems with this is how do you actually define that? And so how do we know that someone is, to is actually clinically or immunologically tolerant? Uh, do you have to be off of therapy for a period of time? Um, you know, is, and so again, we still to this day struggle with kind of defining that. <clears throat> and if you think about it for other allergic diseases, this same situation kind of occurs. So venom allergy is where we sort of point to the most when we're thinking about tolerance and success of treatment, but you know, it's not, we're not constantly stinging these people to kind of have a, a, an assessment of kind of how long does this last. There's not really immune markers that tell us this. and so. Um, you know, it is somewhat of a clinical judgment almost in how that's been defined. Uh, and so, uh, again, we'll come, in, come back to this later, but in 2012, in a study of egg oral immunotherapy, uh, a new term, sustained unresponsiveness, was coined. And really, that was trying to define this period of time when you're not being treated and you seem to be non-reactive, but accepting the fact that we don't know how to define tolerance uh, or we don't know how to measure tolerance, uh, and so this effect could potentially be transient and we don't know. So again, we'll come back to that, and if questions come up regarding these definitions at any point, please stop me. And so uh, again, this is sort of a, a, a nice little graphic that Dr. Burks had put together uh, looking at, or trying to put all the different types of immunotherapy that are, uh, have, have been studied or are being studied onto one graph. And uh, the way I'd look at it is on the left, we're talking about allergen-specific type of treatments, and on the right column, uh, allergen nonspecific. And then they tried to set it up as well um, with uh, therapies that are closer to the top of the screen. Actually, I guess if you can see my screen, can you see the mouse as well? Okay, well, uh, the, the treatments that are closer to the top of the screen being closer to actual practice, uh, or at least sort of by our assessment as well. Um, down at the bottom are more preclinical, and so there's a lot of these sort of uh, studies looking at modified food allergens, and again, those are a pretty far away, so they won't really be talked about here, but most of our talk will look at, uh, first we'll go into sort of the idea of extensively heated or baked milk or egg. We'll go into uh, oral immunotherapy or OIT, sublingual, epicutaneous, and then we'll uh, go into the allergen nonspecific, so the omeluzumab anti-IgE therapy as well as uh, this Chinese herbal formula, FAV2, um, which has uh, been sort of a fascinating idea as well. And so uh, as we kind of get into the idea of immunotherapy, um, again, many of you may have seen sort of graphics like this, but it's pretty good to, uh, I think, go back over what does a typical protocol look like for immunotherapy. And so uh, this, um, again, when you look at this picture over here, the idea is going to be on the far left at the beginning of therapy, of course, you have the allergic patient. And then ultimately to the far right, the goal is going to be to induce tolerance. And so uh, at first, uh, we have typically for a protocol, we'll have an entry food challenge. And again, we want to uh, verify that the patients are allergic before they get into our treatments to be able to know that there has been a difference. Um, and then, you know, importantly to establish whatever that baseline may be. And we do know that food challenge results uh, can vary patient by patient, so it's important to know where, are, where is the patient starting before they even get into therapy. Now, depending on the modality, there may be sort of this period over here that's defined as uh, um, initial modified dose escalation. So there, typically what that is is a one or two day mini rush where multiple doses can potentially be given, and right now that's primarily used in oral immunotherapy. Uh, but across most of the other modalities, there's going to be then sort of uh, similar to um, subcutaneous or environmental uh, allergy shots is going to be a buildup period that uh, in the food world has been typically biweekly. <clears throat> uh, once a maintenance dose is achieved, and again, that can vary study by study, there is an uh, extended period of maintenance dosing followed by a food challenge, which we define as that desensitization food challenge. So again, while on treatment, trying to see where is that threshold compared to baseline, ideally, like the graphic shows, uh, being higher. Uh, than when the patient had started. And then, uh, again, the, the next phase of these, most of the studies, not every study, but most of the studies, is to um, take away the treatment. So again, we've defined desensitization and proven it by a food challenge, and then we actually take the exposure away 
for a period of time and then bring them back for a food challenge or a sustained unresponsiveness or a tolerant food challenge. Um, and so again, they're trying to see where what happens to that reaction threshold when they're off of treatment. But again, uh, like I hinted at on the earlier slide, that one of those questions is, well, how long? I mean, is a few weeks off of treatment, is that clinically important? Is that relevant? Uh, does it need to be several months? I mean, we actually have a study where we have patients off for six months uh, without any treatment at all, then coming back for a challenge. And again, uh, we don't know what the correct number for that is. Um, but I think an important concept there, though, in our in our studies, though, is while we want to answer that question, we do have to balance that with safety. And so, again, you can imagine uh, in the study where we have people off for six months, uh, there is some concern of uh, what if everybody is coming back and failing these challenges and anaphylaxing? Is that ethically correct? And so, a, a difficult a difficult situation that we're in right now. Are there any questions maybe uh, across sort of what these protocols look like? Yeah, and so in that interim of the discontinuation treatment, that's completely off, um, so that's, that's a full elimination diet, correct? That's correct, yes. So um, it is sort of on the patient's sort of honor there that they are supposed to not be cheating and not being exposed, and um, so that is, that is exactly what is supposed to be happening. And, um, you know, we have considered in some studies to, to force the issue by basically providing a placebo treatment there so that they, you know, again, uh, you know, there isn't sort of the risk of cheating. But uh, at this point, it's been avoidance. And uh, depending on which uh, investigator you talk to, I think there's some question of how good we think people are at avoiding. But I think the early studies, uh, that you know, that was very, very good. But as we come closer to having treatments available and more information is out there suggesting that these treatments can be helpful, you know, that, that does become a concern. Any other questions? All right. So uh, again, uh, so now with that background, we're, I wanted to kind of quickly step into extensively heated milk or egg, and uh, any of you that are practicing out there are probably quite familiar with this data. And so um, one of the, uh, Mount Sinai really has kind of pioneered a lot of the, the research around um, baked egg and milk products are extensively heated. And so in 2008, uh, what they showed was they, they actually looked at 100 milk allergic pediatric patients uh, that had a mean age of about almost seven years. Um, there was a wide range, but about seven years. And what they did was they did um, sequential challenges. So first they challenged to bake muffin, which would sort of be the most heated, uh, then a waffle, and then finally to uncooked milk. And so not, not sort of on the same day, but, simul uh, but um, consecutively they would do each of these. And what they found was of that 100 patients that they had found, approximately 10% of these could tolerate all of them, so seemingly had outgrown the allergy that they had had. Um, including those nine, um, there were 68 patients, so about 77%, who were able to tolerate baked milk products. Uh, and then about 23% uh, of those patients couldn't tolerate any milk in any form. And so I think, this again, this was a big deal because uh, prior to this time, um, if someone was diagnosed with milk allergy, even if there was a hint from the history that they were able to eat uh, some forms of it, the, the idea was strict avoidance may be better, safer, and then maybe better for the actual resolution of the allergy. And so this was in my uh, uh, somewhat eye-opening in the large number of patients that seem to be able to tolerate uh, milk in a baked form. Uh, then if you add in, so similar studies were done for baked egg, and again, they found that about 70% or so of patients, um, and basically taking 100 consecutive patients and challenging them to baked egg, what they found was um, that, again, 70% of those were able to tolerate extensively heated or baked egg uh, products. Uh, which was, again, a, a really novel and a very interesting finding that we had had. <clears throat> what they also found was that uh, patients who were tolerant to the heated milk or the heated egg in general seemed to have lower levels of um, allergen-specific IgE, lower skin prick tests, uh, and then lower levels of basophil activation as well. And uh, if you look on the right in a paper uh, published by Wayne Schreffler, what you see is these patients seem to have um, higher levels of uh, T regulatory cells as well, uh, perhaps, again, suggesting that there is a different phenotype for these uh, patients. And, um, and there was also a suggestion, and I'll show you in a slide in a second, that uh, perhaps patients who are able to tolerate uh, some level of this food in baked form uh, maybe had a better sort of prognosis and were more likely to outgrow their allergy. Um, but questions still remained around all of this as far as, first of all, what is, is there 
a correct dose when we're thinking about baked egg or baked milk, uh, a correct amount of the allergen. Uh, the degree of heating has always been a question as well. Does it, uh, again, Mount Sinai has a very strict 350, milligram, uh, 350 degrees for 30 minutes, but what if you do 400 or 200? And so, you know, I think there's been some questions about that. And then another question is how much of this effect has to do with the actual allergen um, structure, so uh, conformational allergens versus linear, uh, compared to maybe this role of a food matrix. And uh, for those that are not familiar, the idea of a food matrix is when you have, uh, again, certain foods or in this case allergens that are, uh, that are cooked together with glutinous type of products, it almost creates a little wall around the allergen, so in a way hides the allergen. And so how much of sort of this uh, ability to tolerate the baked good has to do with sort of that? this matrix or gluten effect versus, uh, again, a change in the actual allergen structure. And so all of that is still sort of being worked out at this point. Uh, but again, this, uh, these are some nice graphics that were published in 2011, again, out of Mount Sinai. And um, actually, if you start on the right, what they looked at is patients who uh, were tolerant to heated milk and compared those to milk allergic sort of controls, so not in the study. And what you see is in the red, uh, just a higher likelihood of these people uh, at, within a period of 60 months outgrowing the actual allergy. Uh, and then on the left, when you look at these same patients uh, compared to those that were not tolerant of the heated milk at the beginning, again, most of those patients, as you see, didn't outgrow their allergy compared to the, the large number of patients who were able to outgrow the allergy um, uh, in that heated milk tolerant group as well. So uh, again, uh, seemingly an important uh, or a reason that it is important to try to figure out for your patients whether they are tolerant or not to it <clears throat> to give them this, this prognosis. <clears throat> and then there's also been some suggestion that perhaps bringing that food into your diet can maybe accelerate the uh, resolution of the allergy, which would of course be great news um, since it seems recently that, uh, you know, again, whether this is a new finding, a, a change, or just a better understanding, but it does seem like more and more patients are hanging on to their egg and milk allergy into later into life, whereas years ago the thought was by grade school many of them would have re, um, been able to outgrow their allergies. So uh, perhaps there is a acceleration of the resolution that happens. Um, but even without that, again, I think there is a significant benefit in quality of life that can occur when, if you can at least get some level of milk or egg into the diets of these patients. So. Um, and so sure enough, what you're seeing in clinical practice now, I think, is more and more pay, um, providers as well as research centers that are, uh, again, actively looking for this and trying to get this into people's diets as possible. Are there any questions on the, the baked milk or egg idea? All right, so we'll move on. <clears throat> and so next I'll talk a lot about oral immunotherapy, and you could almost jump that up on the list a little bit more now. Um, since. Uh, there is, a, uh, again, a company pushing a phase three study uh, um, to trying to push it to the FDA. And so uh, we're getting closer with that. But oral immunotherapy, of course, is uh, probably the best studied of all the forms of immunotherapy. It's, we think of it as a form of mucosal immunotherapy, similar to sublingual. Uh, but the difference is in oral immunotherapy, what we're talking about is a, uh, typically the allergen in a flower form, as you see in the little cup on the left, uh, but really not not uh, something that you can eat sort of as, as is, and so typically mixed in a vehicle food, like in this case, which you see with the boy who seems very happy, although his eyes have been blacked out, um, eating the food allergen mixed with pudding uh, or some other form of sort of vehicle food that makes it more tolerable. <clears throat> uh, so again, this food in oral immunotherapy is actually swallowed or ingested versus sublingual, which there typically it's uh, liquid drops that are absorbed in the mouth and then any residual is sort of swallowed uh, after that. The, um, the doses between the two types of mucosal immunotherapy vary dramatically. So with oral, we're typically thinking about grams to milligrams. And sublingual, we're thinking more milligrams to microgram doses. Um, and then it, it makes sense that with oral, you do wonder how, you know, what's the role of digestion and how much is actually absorbed versus passing through the intestine um, and, and comparing that to sublingual. <clears throat> Now, um, you know, there are many, many studies that have been conducted at this point uh, on oral immunotherapy and actually worldwide and many multi-center uh, studies as well. And so for this particular talk, I'm going to focus on two particular ones. Uh, one of them was on egg oral immunotherapy and then the second one on peanut. So um, 
the, the egg study I wanted to talk about was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012, and this was run by the, uh, the group, the Consortium of Food Allergy Research, which was, uh, again, a, a group of five food allergy, um, food allergy centers across the country, so Mount Sinai, Johns Hopkins, um, Arkansas Children's, uh, our group when we were back at Duke, and then um, in the National Jewish as well. And so there, what we tried to look at was uh, 55 subjects that were between ages of 5 and 18, uh, and then treating them with either egg, oral immunotherapy, or placebo. And um, the ratios, uh, I cannot remember how we came up with it, but it was a strange 8 to 3 ratio, which, again, I'm sure there was a reason for it. But more or less 2 to 1 is kind of what we looked at. And these patients, again, this was a multi-center study, and they were blinded and treated through 48 weeks. And what we found there is uh, at, uh, after about 48 weeks or 10 months, uh, a 5-gram uh, food challenge was conducted. And so for the patients that were on placebo, none of them were able to pass, which is not surprising. Um, and then, you know, again, very positive and exciting for us was 55% of patients that were receiving egg oral immunotherapy were actually able to fully pass this challenge. Many of the failures were still able to eat more than placebo but didn't necessarily pass at that point. These patients were then asked to continue on a maintenance therapy of uh, egg oral immunotherapy for another year. And what we found is, again, not surprising, no one on placebo didn't, uh, was able to pass, so no one sort of um, naturally outgrew their allergy. Uh, but the number of patients actually passing that were on treatment increased. So we had then 75% of uh, patients, so 30 out of the 40 were actually able to pass. And this food challenge, I should have noted, uh, was larger, so 10 grams of egg flour that we were uh, challenging to at this point as well. Um, so a pretty clear difference between those uh, receiving treatment and those on placebo. Uh, Dr. So, Kim? Yes. Oh, <clears throat> this is Paul Dowling. Um, can you tell me what were the ages of those kids? Uh, so, yes, yeah, again, the, the, range, the range of those kids was between 5 and 18, but most of them were sort of in the younger. Um, I'm trying to see if I have that median age listed for you somewhere. Uh, I'm just kind of surprised that there wasn't a single placebo that passed, thinking that you know there's the odds would be that somebody would outgrow it, right. you know, over time. Oh, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So that part was definitely um, something that uh, we didn't uh, ignore, uh, but it was interesting as well. And you just wonder if we have, you know, if we brought in more, a sort of more severe phenotype or something else like that. Maybe perhaps those ones that were not going to outgrow it on their own or it was just going to take longer. But yes, I agree that that's an important point. Uh, I was thinking maybe some of those may have been, <clears throat> um, in some ways, respects, older kids that are probably in that group who just said it might not have outgrown it, but it sounds like right. they had younger kids as well. Yeah, we had a range, but they were sort of more in the 5 to 12 range than, um, than these, the much, much older ones as well. And some of them may be just by virtue of these protocols being very, very difficult to maintain, and especially with the older, the older kids having a lot more sort of uh, activities and things to do, it's harder for them to comply. Um, but, you know, I think um, that, that is a concept to think about for all of our immunotherapy as far as natural people naturally outgrowing, uh, and then also just the practicality of some of these protocols as well. Um, but moving on, so then uh, what happened was with these folks, what they decided was, well, let's measure this sustained unresponsiveness or this uh, pseudo-tolerance or whatever term you want to use. And so uh, they had these patients stop their therapy for four weeks, and um, many of them did react again, but 28% of those patients were still able to pass that 10-gram challenge after a month off of therapy. Uh, and again, this had not been sort of defined or kind of presented in other data, at least in, in sort of this multicenter blinded way. So, uh, so this was a big deal and got published in New England Journal. Um, and uh, but, you know, I will say some, from the research point of view, this was a little disappointing. I think our hope was that we were, you know, providing a long-lasting benefit here uh, and we're expecting a bigger number. So uh, patients who failed this were continued on therapy. And so with another 12 months of therapy, what we found was closer to 45% of patients were able to actually pass. And as we have pushed it further out, and a slightly higher number as well. Uh, so suggesting possibly that the duration of treatment is important here. Uh, and again, paralleling what we see with venom allergy, um, again, anywhere from three to five years of treatment seems to be necessary to get sort of the lasting immune effects as well. Uh, and so perhaps early on we get a transient desensitization effect, but it takes longer levels of treatment to get the lasting effects. 
And so now I'll switch over to peanut, which again is where most of the attention has been recently. And so the study I'll talk about, and again, you may, many of you may have already seen, but uh, this was um, the paper that was done out of our group at Duke, um, published in 2011. It was the first double-blind study of peanut OIT. So a few s smaller studies were done earlier, including by our group that suggested a benefit, but the first blinded study. Uh, and they had 25 subjects that were randomized two to one to receive either peanut OIT or placebo. And so, um, I mean, it doesn't take much to look at this graph and just see that there's a dramatic difference. So basically, everybody who was on treatment uh, that was able to reach the food challenge uh, was able to pass. So the, the y-axis is a little bit misleading. So 5,000 was the maximum that we went to. Uh, and so everybody who was on treatment was able to pass that, compared to those on placebo, where, again, clearly you see they're way down here with a median tolerated dose of about 280 milligrams or one peanut. Um, and so, again, this was really, really exciting. Again, even better than what we were seeing for egg OIT. Now, I think there is one caveat to this graph in that three of the patients on treatment were not able to get to this point. And so in an intention to treat, they would have been failures there. And so um, uh, it does, again, m multiple studies since then have sort of said the same thing, that um, not, it is a difficult treatment and not everyone can tolerate it, but the ones that are able to stay on treatment do tend to do very well is what we have seen. Uh, so we took these patients as well as some others at the University of Arkansas where we were um, collaborating, uh, and they were on an OIT protocol. And there, what we tried to look at is, again, this idea of sustained unresponsiveness. So sure, after a year, we saw some great stuff, but what is the actual um, potential for these treatments to create some level of lasting benefit? So um, these patients were treated anywhere from 33 to 70 months. And the reason for that timeline is, or the, uh, the, the wide range is what we were looking for was um, actual immune parameters before we went to a challenge. So we wanted patients whose skin tests were less than five millimeters and then their IgE less than 15 uh, before they would go on to sort of these end of treatment type of um, uh, challenges. And what happened was they would have, again, a last day of treatment desensitization food challenge a period of time of one month off of therapy and then another challenge to uh, determine whether they had some of this sustained unresponsiveness. Uh, and what we found there was 11 of these subjects were actually able to, um, uh, to be off of therapy for four weeks and then still pass their challenge. And all of these 11 patients were then able to incorporate peanut into their diet ad lib, which again was really, really exciting for us having never seen this before. Um, now, if you look at the attention to treat, what we found there is eight patients couldn't get there. And so, um, so 11 of the 19 who actually got to those challenges were able to, uh, to actually pass and, and bring food into their diet ad lib, but the percent drops down to more like 41% if you uh, include these patients who were not able to com complete the treatment for one reason or another. Now, uh, yes. Sorry. By ad lib, do you mean are they continuing to eat a set amount every day, or they're just eating it when and if they choose? So that's a great, great point to bring up. So uh, when these studies were actually happening, the, the this older study, uh, we were um, I think more optimistic that we were inducing true tolerance and uh, a lasting, lasting benefit. And so it really was ad lib at the time of go ahead and eat as much as you want whenever you want to. Just make sure everyone once in a while you have some. So kind of wishy-washy guidelines, but really, you know, in a way, truly ad-lib. Uh, what you see more recently across our studies and just across experts is um, more guidelines around that. So now what you're hearing is much more of eat this much, eat 300 milligrams or one peanut or two peanuts and eat this on a regular basis at least, you know, five or six times a week. And um, I think some of that has to do with us as a um, a research body kind of understanding more that we think the effects right now are not long-lasting uh, and so that daily exposure is needed. Uh, and then again, the safety aspect out there is always a concern. We've had patients who are sort of on low levels of peanut food at home who are actually having reactions to those doses. And so I think um, sort of a better understanding of the actual desensitization and SU effect is probably leading to, to that difference that you're, I think you're suggesting. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Perfect. All right. And so uh, we did a, look at immunity. Yes? I'm sorry. I, d kind of on that same uh, um, vein, I guess, um, if um, with, this, with the company that's, co that's trying to get approval for their oral peanut powder, um, 
from what you're saying, then I, uh, it would almost um, um, be reasonable to say that they have a, a maintenance um, packet of peanut that you take just like you would take a, an allergy pill every day. Exactly, yeah. So at this point, again, uh, a lot of sort of the um, experts have gone to the idea that this is not, this is not long-lasting. It may last a short period of time, but we don't know how much. We don't know how to predict those people well. I mean, again, we, I'll show you in a second some data that maybe suggests some biomarkers around that, but that that's still a work in progress. So really right now, those treatments that are being pushed to the FDA are thought to be lifelong treatments. We've, right. the, the the issue okay. we've had is when we've when, when patients have been off of food like peanut especially for for long periods of time and the parents have kept t telling them don't have peanuts that can kill you it can kill you it can kill you that even when we come in and they pass an oral challenge a lot of these kids don't want to have any peanut after that they've just been so ingrained um, that they don't want to do it we we usually tell our patients that they pass an oral challenge that they've outgrown it that we advise them to have it in their diet probably three times a week. Um, right. Yeah. They have I mean, there's, source. I, I, there's a, I want to say at least one or two case reports of, of, of patients who have outgrown it, who didn't eat it, and then perhaps uh, redevelop their allergy. And so, I, you know, there, it's not well studied by any means, but I think there's some concern that if you don't get in the diet that that could happen. Um, but, you know, I think this sort of uh, food aversion is definitely a concern that we have. And, some of it is, I think, going to be psychologic. Um, some of it is sort of training from the parents. And some of it is just, I think, I mean, the way I describe it to my patients is almost a survival instinct. I mean, I think the taste and the texture and the smell of uh, peanut in particular, I think, is very, very difficult to overcome for some of these patients, even when they have passed the challenge and should be able to eat this. And um, so I think, again, some of these, these are very um, important factors that we are seeing in our research right now that I think, you know, again, we're going to, we'll see how this sort of plays out as uh, these products potentially come to market. So uh, let me move on a little bit and we can come back to some questions. Um, but we did again look at, I, I just mentioned, we looked at some immune markers as well within this group. And uh, when we looked at baseline peanut IgE, it did seem like uh, if you start lower, you're more likely to uh, de develop this tolerance or this SU. Um, and then uh, across all immunotherapy trials, including um, uh, error allergen subcutaneous, what we see is early on in treatment, very uh, what you typically see is an increase in that specific Ig followed by sort of a steady decrease below baseline, and so with our food stuff it's no different. But interestingly, if you look at the blue as being the ones that are tolerant uh, versus the red that were not tolerant, what you see is that that increase is is much more exaggerated in the group that ultimately does not demonstrate this sustained unresponsiveness. And so again, is this perhaps a sign that these could could be used as sort of biomarkers? Uh, with these future treatments? I mean, I hope so. I hope so. And um, you know, they are doing a lot of sort of immunological work around these treatments, so we'd be really excited to sort of see where these things go. Um, but I think it is important that whatever biomarker tests are, are found, they really need to be practical, ones that everyone can do in their uh, pretty easily out of their offices as opposed to you know, super sophisticated tests that are done in one place in the world kind of stuff. Um, even us here at UNC, we're eagerly waiting to see what that's going to look like. Um, and then again, uh, the, wrapping up sort of the, the uh, biomarkers and immunological markers, so we do see an increase in regulatory cells, uh, T regulatory cells early on. But what was interesting there is that level seemed to decrease with extended treatment. And whether, uh, how, what that means, we're not entirely sure at this point, uh, whether they are sort of uh, more efficient cells at that stage or maybe somehow not needed at that stage. Um, and then looking at uh, TH2 cytokines, we see a steady decrease in IL-5 and IL-13. And when we compare the suppressive uh, or regulatory IL-10 versus IL-13, we see an increase in that with increased treatment too. So it uh, really looks, again, or, um, oral immunotherapy really looks like it's not only a clinical benefit, but it is modulating the immune effect here as well. And perhaps, uh, again, leading to some level of lasting immune changes. So uh, let me roll into sublingual. And so again, this is uh, the modality that I personally have studied the most uh, since my fellowship with Dr. Burks. And um, there are far fewer studies for sublingual. Uh, and so two of them in particular, that I'll, I'll, well, actually, I'll talk about three of them. But um, I'll start with sort of the peanut slit that was done by the COFAR group again, and then the one that was done by our group at Duke uh, wrapping up here at UNC. 
So in COFAR, they looked at, they were actually going to look at older adults, but had some trouble recruiting. So ended up ca uh, capturing a group that was more like older teenagers. Uh, and again, done over the five centers as part of COFAR with 40 subjects. And they were randomized to get either peanut slit or placebo. And so a little bit of a complicated um, protocol that they had. But at week uh, 44, what you see on a log scale, of course, is that there was sort of an increase in the uh, successfully consumed dose during a food challenge. Now, if you think back to the oral immunotherapy, the peanut OIT studies, those, everyone there was at the 5,000 mark uh, across the board. So uh, here, with all the different lines for the different subject, you just see there is a broad range of responses. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, and then extending that treatment out further, there was slightly, uh, again, a continued increase in that threshold. But again, a big range that you see. The median we put at 996, but you know these folks down here, we're looking at maybe uh, 100 or 200 milligram protection level. So you know, is that clinically relevant is, I think, an outstanding question. But definitely a signal here that is different than placebo and different from baseline. Our study uh, was a single center study started at Duke. And what we looked at were kids that were uh, likely to be allergic. So we did not have an entry food challenge at that time uh, worried about safety. Uh, obviously, these days, peanut challenges are done all the time, and so that's not a factor. Uh, but we, we looked at patients ages 1 to 11 with a peanut IgE of greater than 7 and a strong clinical history uh, to suggest that they might be allergic. Uh, and then they underwent um, treatment with 2 milligrams. Uh, and this is compared to anywhere from a few thousand um, uh, 300 up to uh, 4,000 milligrams that have been commonly used in OIT. Uh, but with 2 milligrams, we treated them for a year and then had a food challenge as well. And on the left is the data that we've presented in the past. But what you see is, again, the medians, there is a definite difference between placebo that's statistically significant. But again, what you see is a broad range, kind of like what we saw in the COFAR data. So we've got some folks over here who do wonderfully. Uh, again, passing uh, 2,500 milligrams. We didn't push them further. So what their true threshold is, we don't know. We've got some sort of in the middle, some partial responders, I guess you could call them. But then we clearly have this group here that's no different than placebo. So, um, so very excited that there's a signal here, but kind of curious on what's going on and can we differentiate between these folks here as well. Um, when we look at skin tests, so what we found here was that there was a decrease across the board uh, for patients, or mostly across the board for patients who were on SLIS. Um, and so, yeah, and so that's, you know, after 12 months, that was what we've seen. And recently at the Quad AI, earlier this year, we presented data that looked at five years of treatment for these folks. And uh, what we found was that median level of protection more or less stayed at the about the 800 milligram mark. Um, but the vast majority, about 85% of patients, were able to tolerate more than 300 milligrams uh, after treatment. And 300, we think of, again, as one peanut. And perhaps a, I guess I'd like to think of that as a clinically significant amount. If, if you believe the data that 100 milligrams is about the median amount that it takes to cause a reaction. Um, but a signal there that we have uh, a, a extended treatment can potentially protect more people. And then there was a very modest 20% uh, of patients able to demonstrate SCU from this sublingual group as well. Um, sublingual was also studied in a very unique way at Hopkins. And so they did a study of milk, OIT, and sublingual. And uh, this was sort of their diagram. I'll, I'll try to walk you through it. Um, but again, a little bit complicated. But what they basically had was a baseline food challenge to establish the allergy, a buildup period with sublingual, and then a randomization period here at T2 to either continue on sublingual or go to two different doses of OIT, so a medium dose and then a high dose is what they found uh, or what they looked at. They had a food challenge after a year and then another food challenge after five years and then a couple periods of time off of therapy as well. So with that in mind, uh, the data that they found, so here on the far left is folks that were on sublingual and stayed on sublingual. So after one year of treatment, there was an increase, but not dramatic. And then after five years of treatment, you see that that benefit increases more uh, as well. And so with the median around here, a little over 2,000 milligrams. B and C represent sort of the medium dose, uh, so sublingual into a medium dose OIT and sublingual into a high dose OIT. And so not surprisingly, what you see is far higher levels of uh, desensitization, even after one year. So uh, over here where the mouse is, at T4 for the B, and then uh, basically full pass. Uh, in the high dose OIT group as well. And so at the time, it was really interpreted as uh, sublingual 
uh, really it just has no real role, and OIT is really the way we need to go for this. Um, now, interestingly, they followed these patients out and have found that this, even these dramatic results that you see in B and C uh, don't seem to be lasting. And even after very short amounts of time off of therapy, a week or two, some patients have already started to lose some of that benefit. Uh, so again, I'm mean, kind of trying to wrap up the OIT and sublingual research that we see. So um, pretty consistently, especially for OIT, but even for sublingual, I'd like to say that we do see some level of desensitization. Uh, it seems to begin pretty rapidly uh, and definitely within a few months of treatment, and that threshold will go up. Um, allergic side effects. So in particular for OIT, there are um, up to there have been multiple studies suggesting up to 20% of subjects are not able to tolerate oral immunotherapy to the, to the level that they are not able to complete and have to drop out of these studies. And of those 20%, a significant proportion of them seem to have GI side effects, so uh, recurrent um, debilitating abdominal pain, some of them even recurrent vomiting, uh, food aversion, things along those lines. Um, there's been a lot of question of how much of this is, is this EOE, what is going on here? And, uh, most of these patients ne never go on to get an endoscopy to actually make this diagnosis. Um, uh, since taking the, the, the actual food, the peanut, out of the diet seems to resolve these symptoms. But it's sort of an outstanding question or concern that's out there of, you know, are we creating sort of another disease uh, while tr trying to treat one of them? Um, there's also some concern about uh, even in patients that have been on steady treatment and been um, doing well with it, are there scenarios where uh, their threshold can change? And what we have found is in young kids, when they have viral infections or febrile infections, or in the young and older, when they have a lot of exercise, vigorous exercise, we've seen patients who have tolerated their dose for many months, if not years, suddenly have a reaction. Um, and then interestingly for those patients, as soon as that uh, insult is done, the infection is gone, the exercise is done, that next day they can go right back to that same dose that they're at. So sort of these transient changes in their threshold has been uh, something that we're trying to better understand. Um, and then like I mentioned before with the Hopkins uh, uh, milk OIT treatment, uh, sublingual OIT, it seemed like even after a very short amount of time, patients, some patients were losing that benefit as well. Again, we continue to do mechanistic studies to try to understand what, what these treatments are actually doing and, again, whether we can predict the lasting effect from these. Um, and then this idea of tolerance, again, we don't know how to measure it, but at this point it does, you know, the indications have suggested that these benefits wear off uh, and do require um, a regular exposure to the actual uh, allergen itself. So, um, I'm going to try to keep rolling into epicutaneous as we're uh, sort of at the 45 mark. And so epicutaneous, or um, <clears throat> the peanut patch, I guess, is what people most people are calling it these days. So right now there's only one, one sort of product for this. The original studies were done by Senti and published and involved a lot of tape stripping and some of that. Uh, but this company called DBV just uh, came up with sort of a proprietary uh, kind of patch that I'll try to walk you through how it works. And it's, it's a pretty cool idea. But essentially what they have is uh, a small kind of quarter, eh, maybe a half dollar size uh, patch, and it's got an adhesive around it. And the idea is that this is placed on the skin, on the back, and within there, uh, there is sort of a foam ring and then this sort of adhesive on top. And so what it creates is what, they, what we would call sort of a condensation chamber here. So there's dry allergen that is stuck to the actual upper layer here, uh, and then the patch is again applied on onto the skin. What you have is then with that with, with a good seal, you'll have natural evaporation of water through the skin. And the thought is that that is going to then uh, accumulate on the top of the patch, liquefying the actual dry allergen, uh, and then allowing the allergen to then go through those open pores and get uh, to the Langerhans cells and the other immune cells in the skin that we think would be important for inducing tolerance. Um, now, one of the, uh, the, the safety thoughts here is that uh, hopefully with this model, we have minimal, if any, allergen reaching the bloodstream and uh, potentially causing systemic effects as well. So um, again, very attractive from the safety and, of course, the, uh, the, um, the uh, um, acceptability of the treatment or the, uh, the administration uh, effect as well. And this kind of goes back to sort of that food aversion that we had talked about earlier. Again, these patients uh, have been told forever, don't eat peanuts, you're going to get sick, you're going to die. Um, and then suddenly us trying to tell them, no, it's a good thing, why don't you do that? Um, for a lot of people, it doesn't work. And perhaps sort of using a different approach 
uh, can be a way to bypass or bypass that for some of these patients. And so uh, this epicutaneous immunotherapy was first looked at for milk allergy um, in a small pilot. And basically what they had was three months of treatment and then a food challenge here as well. And so here's the data that you see. And so on the left, what you see here is patients that were on treatment and on the right, patients who were on placebo. And uh, again, it's a log scale that we're dealing with. But if you start with the placebos, basically between baseline and three months, all the lines are flat. Uh, so not much difference in sort of how much milk they were able to tolerate versus, again, a, a lot of variability that you see. But in general, you do see an increase in the amount of milk that the, the, the group uh, on the milk patch were able to tolerate. Now, it is interesting that the baseline for these guys was lower. So, you know, how did that happen, I guess, is kind of curious. But it did seem to be a signal in an early study that there could be a benefit. Now, the patients that were on placebo, if you go back on the right, these dotted lines, they were crossed over to be on treatment. And so it did seem like these patients did have a response as well. So enough of a signal that they, you know, it was worthwhile to move forward with it. And so at this point, um, uh, probably the biggest news is that the, the, this company has uh, gone on and created a patch for peanut allergy. And they are also in phase three, uh, sort of running parallel with the company that is um, promoting the peanut oral immunotherapy as well. And so both, uh, both companies uh, have phase three international, international studies that are happening right now. Um, and really, again, what they're trying to, they've both got the breakthrough therapy status as well as the um, fast track status to the FDA, which hopefully will be good news for all the millions of patients that we see uh, that are looking for some level of treatment. And um, it will be fascinating to kind of watch what happens um, because um, it's not just about efficacy, but again, safety, administration, compliance, I think all of these have to be considered by the FDA. So um, uh, I think like everybody else, I'm very, very curious to kind of see where all of this goes. Um, and here are some examples of some of the studies that they have uh, been conducting for uh, peanut, uh, with the peanut patch. And so again, one in, uh, international study in France. Again, this was the big multi-center study, phase two study that was done by the company. And then COFAR also was involved. So um, we, na we na numbered it COFAR-6, but within the COFAR group, we also did a study of this patch and seemed to show a benefit as well um, uh, after treatment here. So in the last 10 minutes, I'll try to go over a couple of allergen nonspecific treatments. And so we'll start with anti-IgE therapy. And so omeluzumab, again, anti-IgE has been uh, studied in two randomized controlled trials for peanut allergy, uh, both of these uh, quite a while ago, actually, 2003, and although published in 2011, actually uh, occurred earlier than that. Um, and I think what I will say there is try to just summarize those quickly. Both studies seem to show a, an increase in reaction threshold when on omeluzumab, um, but there was a, again, a, like, like what you see with epicutaneous and like what you see with sublingual, there was a range of benefits. Uh, and then also, not many patients were, or not a large proportion of patients were actually fully passing a challenge. And the reason I'm saying it this way is that back then in 2003, that was really our goal. We were looking for people to fully pass large amounts, uh, you know, challenges to large amounts of food allergen or peanut with the thought that this would indicate somehow that they were more likely to become tolerant. Um, but if you fast forward to today, really, again, the, the, the thought is that this is not achievable, that we're maybe not able to fully tolerate. And so a clinically significant desensitization is an appropriate goal at this stage. And so suddenly, these results from omeluzumab from years ago have become relevant again, because it seemed like at that time that it was able to provide uh, perhaps these levels of sort of transient desensitization as well. Uh, the second study that was published in 2011 uh, had 26 patients but was stopped prematurely because of some safety issues, including uh, severe adverse reactions during food challenges as well. Um, but uh, what we found here is an increase in tolerability in, in the peanut omeluzumab treated group versus placebo there as well. And so um, right now, really, we're thinking about anti-IgE therapy as still we're, I think a lot of us are interested in maybe revisiting it as a potential monotherapy. Uh, but really, the most recent data has been around using it as an adjunct to oral immunotherapy. And um, uh, the study that's listed here that Dr. Brooks put in here from Kari Nadeau looked at uh, omeluzumab in combination with milk oral immunotherapy. And what they were able to find in their single site was uh, that you were able to increase 
the uh, or a build up much more quickly and in a safer way with the ad additional use of omeluzumab. And um, I don't have the, the reference here, but even more recently um, in a paper that was first authored by uh, McGinnity, uh, they looked at omeluzumab in combination with peanut oil immunotherapy and uh, in a multi-center way and showed some exciting uh, results there where even on that very first day during that mini rush escalation that I had pointed out way at the beginning of the talk, uh, they're able to push patients up to as high as 900 milligrams on the first day, so three whole peanuts in one day. Uh, whereas most of the OIT protocols that we currently use, we max, them out, max, them, we max out at about 6 to 12 milligrams, so 900 versus 6. Um, and then they were able to build up on a weekly basis as opposed to biweekly and get to a, a protective maintenance dose far, far, far quicker. So um, again, a lot of sort of positive data suggesting that omeluzumab may have a role as an adjunct, and it would be interesting to see if perhaps uh, it could be used as a monotherapy, but those studies still need to be done at this point. Are there any questions on omeluzumab? All right, so I'll move on to kind of the more esoteric but really interesting to me uh, Chinese herbal formula. And so uh, really what they found was that there was this Chinese herbal formula that ultimately ended up being called um, uh, FAB2, which is food allergy herbal formula. And really the way the story starts is they found that this herbal formula in a mouse model was able to actually stop anaphylaxis. Uh, and it seemed like it was allergen nonspecific, which would be really exciting if you consider how many patients we see that are multi-allergic. If peanut OIT takes five years and you're allergic to five other tree nuts, I mean, just doing the math, it's just not practical. And so uh, I think the idea of sort of not allergen nonspecific treatments is uh, very, very attractive. And so here it seemed like something that was able to dial down anaphylaxis uh, without requiring sort of specific an, uh, antigen exposure. Um, it was after the mouse data, they tried to sort of narrow down, must, you know, thinking it must be one component of this herbal formula, and interestingly it was not. And so it, uh, they were able to <coughs> narrow it down to nine herbs, uh, but it did seem that those nine herbs were needed to uh, provide this protective effect. And um, eventually they were able to bring it over to some phase one human studies at this point, and it seems that it's well tolerated <coughs> with, um, with only some minor gastrointestinal symptoms. And so phase two studies for this are uh, currently underway. Uh, but my understanding from this treatment is uh, I am very excited about it with the idea that, again, it could be the allergen nonspecific, but from what I understand, it is somewhat of an unwieldy treatment at this point, requiring uh, three or four times a day dosing with sort of larger pills. And so um, definitely something that I think should not, you know, should continue to be studied, but it does seem like it's a lot farther away than I would have hoped at this stage as well. Um, but again, just it was a nice way to kind of come back to this reminder that the allergen-specific uh, treatments that we are talking a lot about are exciting, but, um, you know, again, thinking about the practicality of it, especially in our multi-allergic patients, I think is very, very important. Questions on the herbal therapy? All right, so uh, I'll kind of summarize. So, um, so here, again, uh, one of the, the major question that comes up again is this idea of tolerance. So we started off the whole talk thinking about desensitization and tolerance, and really, ultimately, what, you know, our goal started out trying to cure food, trying to cure food allergy, but uh, I think we have to ask ourselves, can we do it? Is it lifelong or is it transient? Um, and so from right now, I think we can't say for sure. I think, and if anything, the suggestion is that our current treatments that we are studying are more likely to be transient desensitization. Um, it does sort of bring up the question, though, for all allergic diseases, uh, does true, can we truly induce tolerance? And uh, I think there will be lots of arguments on both sides for this one, um, but I think that question does come up. And um, in particular, again, uh, what you see here is sort of in this bullet point is the idea that even for immune, um, subcutaneous environmental immunotherapy, when we stop therapy, they aren't truly off of therapy at that point. So there is ongoing exposure that happens in the environment. So is that kind of what is able to continue and provide that lasting benefit, or is it truly just from that immunotherapy that we provided? Um, in typical food allergy, though, that doesn't happen. I mean, you have to actually intentionally ingest that food. And so, um, again, a slightly different scenario we're thinking about. And so, again, can we induce long-lasting um, in any diseases? And so, 
uh, kind of three questions to sort of leave you with. And so one question that we are absolutely constantly thinking about is what's the mechanisms for developing allergic disease and food allergy? Uh, and is it, again, most of the attention has been on regulatory T cells, but more recently there's been even more attention on uh, regulatory B cells. And um, just, again, that, that multifactorial immune response that's happening here, understanding sort of which components uh, or maybe all the components are important and how do we sort of uh, attack each one of these to be able to try to protect our patients. Um, again, what is true tolerance? So in the, in the context of food allergy, and so um, you know, how do we define that? And um, let me back up to that. Uh, a study that would be really amazing to do, but has been pretty much near impossible, would be to try to study uh, those patients who do naturally outgrow the food allergy and compare those to ones that are actually getting treatment and look at those immune uh, markers for them and see what's different. I say it's impossible just because capturing enough of the patients that naturally outgrow within these studies uh, has been quite difficult. But, um, but even the, in the small numbers that we have, I think it's important that we try to look at these. And hopefully, uh, these phase three studies, which brought in many, many, many more patients, um, this will be something that we'll be able to look at a little better than we have in the past. Um, and then again, uh, is ongoing antigen exposure necessary for this long-term maintenance of tolerance? And right now, that's sort of the approach that we've had. And within all of our studies, when we have our patients, quote, unquote, graduating, so passing or doing very well in a food challenge, uh, really the thought process there has been these families have dedicated several years uh, of their lives to us and we've put tons of energy and no one wants to take the chance that um, we're wrong and it's not lasting and they go back to baseline. And so the recommendation that we have given is in general for these patients to try to incorporate some low level amount of the food allergen into their diet with the hopes that that will help them to maintain whatever protective effect they've gotten from their treatments at this point. But, um, uh, again, a, an outstanding question that will be important for us to continue to watch, and in particular, uh, if and when these treatments um, get out to the general public, it would be you know really fascinating to kind of see sort of how the long the the long term sort of use of those treatments uh, ends up being done. And so with that, I just uh, again thanks to lots of folks actually. So in particular, our Duke UNC folks that are listed here. Um, folks at Arkansas who we've collaborated with um, considerably, especially with the peanut OIT, of course the COFAR group, um, NIH, MS, and uh, the Immune Tolerance Network and other ones. Uh, with that, I am happy to try to take any questions if there's a few more minutes left over. Um, uh, Dr. Kim, this is Paul Daly again. Um, for, the, um, for the patch for peanut versus the powder, um, the um, is the is the is a do you think the goal for the patch is to basically um, achieve um, an equivalent of like um, protection for one peanut or something as opposed to the powder which seems to um, you know be more like three or four peanuts equivalent? Yeah. So what I'll say there is um, I think really the. The, the field, in, the industry part especially, but the field in general has gone again to this idea that um, more is not necessarily better. And so really again, trying to uh, be an adjunct to avoidance therapy is really what, what I think is the direction we're going. And so both the peanut flower and the peanut patch companies are approaching it that way. So uh, patients are supposed to use their product but continue strict avoidance. And so these products are supposed to just provide that level of protection in case of the accidental ingestion that may happen. And so one outstanding question with that is, you know, how much is how much does an accidental ingestion actually mean? Uh, again, there's uh, some wimpy data that suggests maybe 100 milligrams, but that's very very wimpy data. And so I think it's important to try to understand what that might be, because um, if we consider sort of a standard accidental ingestion to be a few hundred milligrams, well, you know, I think it, it sort of tells us what we need as far as protection. If it's far less than that, um, you know, again, it changes things. And so uh, although the peanut flower in general is going to push thresholds higher, um, they are not pushing their product as something that is going to allow sort of freely eating lots of, lots of peanut foods or anything else. Really, that's meant to be an adjunct to avoidance therapy. No, I was just thinking if, you know, as a parent, if you were to have a, a therapy that you know, my kid could accidentally maybe do okay if he got the equivalent of a peanut or so, or maybe less than that. But um, um, versus, you know, 
if I was able to, he was able accidentally to get, you know, three peanuts or something, which you think would be more than you'd, you'd find in like a cookie or something that they didn't realize had peanut in it or something. Right. So, I mean, again, I think these are very, very important questions that are out there right now of, again, um, uh, how, I mean, I think I'm, I'm very curious on sort of what patient behaviors will look like sort of on treatment because, in general, you would think that these um, avoidance measures may become somewhat lax. Um, but, you know, I think there is some question about uh, how much cushion do you need, so sort of what you're suggesting, and, um, and is a three times the median exposure good enough, ten times, I mean, is there some magic number there that would provide reassurance? And so I think we have to balance that with sort of the, the safety and the ease of administration. And I think uh, it'll be fascinating to see sort of where families fall with that. I think there will be a subset of families that it's really, they're, they're, it's too difficult, they're, they're too busy to do the oral immunotherapy because it is more involved. Uh, and for them, they may feel that uh, they're okay with a lower level of protection, but the patch is important. And then I think there will be others who, for whatever reason, may think that their child is at higher risk uh, to get exposed to higher amounts. And for them, sort of the a little, maybe perhaps extra work that may be involved with OIT is, is worth it for that purpose. And um, in a perfect world for me as, a, as a, an allergist, though, I would love to see multiple products for us to be able to sort of work with patients to find that right kind of um, treatment for them, or maybe even um, combinations of treatments might be interesting too. So perhaps you know, there is a way that, um, I mean, I'm totally making this up, it's not being studied, but perhaps you know, maybe you can build them up with a peanut flower but then maintain them longer term with a patch, or, or maybe the patch is a nice way to sort of get people that are scared or averse to the ingestion of peanut, get them sort of built up and somewhat protected and then switch them over. And, and so, uh, again, I think in a perfect world, we would have choices, and then us as allergists working with these families and these patients could come up with sort of the best way to treat each one. So with the, with the patch, um, I, you know, I can see with the, with the powder that you continue with having some equivalent amount of peanut in your diet, but with the patch, with it being um, so small, and if they're, they're kind of averse to taking peanut, I would think that you'd almost, you'd have to basically well, at this point, think about having being on the patch indefinitely. Right, right. So again, right now, the thought is for both treatments, they're meant to be long term because uh, there's, you know, again, they're not. Uh, there's no indication that either of them is going to uh, create this long term tolerance. So yeah, so that that really is the thought. And <coughs> some people have wondered, can you? Uh, I think what you're hinting at, but can oh, is there some sort of conversion from a patch over to equivalent? Come on up to the test um, floor until 2 p.m. All are welcome. Save a life today. Come on up to the test floor until 2 p.m. All are welcome. Save a life today. Sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that sounds exciting. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think there has been some sort of question um, of is there a um, is there a conversion? Like, is a certain like time or protection on patch? Can you switch them over to? Is there an equivalent of food? that they could switch to and do that at home sort of as a maintenance therapy. Uh, for the flower, clearly that's an easy one-to-one -one calculation there, but for the patch, that doesn't exist. And even for sublingual, that same question comes up is, sure, on sublingual you got them to a certain level of protection, but can you really convert a two milligram peanut drop into some level of food that they can, you know, that you can be confident they're going to be safe to do at home uh, on a routine basis? And again, all of that's unclear at this point. And I know, like, with all the gluten-free and stuff, they make almond flour and cashew flour. Have, has that been done for the oral immunotherapy with tree nuts? Um, meaning they've doing tree nut OIT, do you mean? Or I'm, I'm trying to yes. understand the question. Yes, yeah, so tree nuts. Um, yeah, so, um, I, so Arkansas Children's in particular has really taken um, – uh, been proactive about tree nuts, and so uh, I, I didn't have a chance to present it here. But they've showed, showed some pretty interesting data where uh, they're. It seems like they're e they're able to take advantage of some of the cross reactivities that may occur between tree nuts. But basically, finding multi tree nut allergic patients, treating them with only one OIT, so OIT to say walnut, uh, but finding a benefit across multiple uh, food allergies. So you know, I think there's going to be a lot of really interesting data that's going to come out of Arkansas as well. But um, but you know, tree nuts are. Uh, they go hand in hand for a lot of patients with peanut allergies, so they can't be ignored. And so I, we're starting to see some of the early uh, research into that as well.
And do you think that those OITs could ever be combined or done concurrently with Pina and Trinet? Yes. So uh, actually, if you go to Kari Nadeau's um, site at Stanford, uh, they've actually done a lot of this multi-OIT and have been able to publish on it, as well as some in the popular media talk about that. Uh, and so it does seem like it can be done safely. Um, you know, questions are long term, is this, you know, can this be maintained and is the safety somehow any different or worse? I, I mean, there's some outstanding questions there, but just the simple question of can you combine multiple ones, they've started to do that uh, and shown some good stuff. And in addition, they've actually even looked at using um, omeluzumab as a way of making that multi-OIT a safer way, to, a, a safer treatment as well. And so. Uh, a lot of preliminary data, but exciting preliminary data coming out of Stanford as well. Well, we've taken a lot of your time this morning. We appreciate you um, spending your time this morning uh, giving us the talk. And it was a great